in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The labor of all church workers shall never be in vain as our Father, the Father of all globally, the convener of GCK, Pastor Dr. W. F. Kumui gives us the Global Church Workers Conference live from Taraba State, Nigeria. All church workers and ministers globally to join hands with all ministers across Taraba State, Northern Nigeria from 17 to 20 November 2022. It's our time for triumphing in ministry, even in troublous times. Pastor Dr. W. F. Kumui will be ministering 8 a.m. daily from Jalingo, Taraba State, to the world, brass satellites, and on all our social media platforms. It will be an avalanche of global expositions and revelations. Your labor will not be in vain. When we started the year 2022, you had hopes, you had desires, you had dreams, but suddenly, all over the globe, we read and hear of failures economically, politically, with climate change and security breaches here and there. And now, I hear a voice echoing towards the northeastern geopolitical zone of Nigeria. Now, I hear a voice echoing towards the northeastern geopolitical zone of Nigeria. Today, the Lord is saying, weep not. All your tears are dried, because behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed. And it's confirmed that there's still one hope, one way, one solution, and one power that never fails. The power of Jesus Christ reverberates this November with GCK live from Adamawa State, Nigeria. The land of beauty set to beautify your life through Christ. As the covenant of GCK, Pastor Dr. W. F. Kumui will touch down in Adamawa, Nigeria with a power that never fails. Healing, deliverance, salvation. November 24 to 29, 2022. 1600 hours GMT daily and 0700 hours GMT for Sunday worship service. Young people from all levels will be empowered for excellence at the Impact Academy on November 26, 2022 at 0600 hours GMT. Ministers and professionals will be empowered for breakthrough in ministry on November 25, 26, 28, and 29 at 0600 hours GMT. Our guest gospel minister is Bob Feets. This is an avalanche of manifestation of the power that never fails for all life. Power will herald your celebration. Dr. William Kumui says, Be it confirmed in your life in Jesus' name. GCK, the gospel to every creature. In Jesus' name we pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the meeting we have this morning. We are praying, O oh Lord, that you speak to our hearts as never before. We are asking, Lord, that no syllable of your word will fall to the ground, but everything will pierce the heart of all your children and we pray lord that this morning will become a turning point in our lives in our careers in everything that we do help us lord to hear the voice of the spirit single us out and speak directly to us in Jesus' name, we pray. In Numbers chapter 12, we're looking at verses 7 and 8. My servant Moses 
is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? St. James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Sometimes some messages lose their value because some believers have heard such messages over and over again. And sometimes believers have shallow understanding of a particular subject because we feel that we know the references related to that subject. And we feel that we have already experienced what that subject is talking about. And we feel that what we just need to do is to continue and maintain and grow in that experience. And we feel that we're different from other so-called Christians who do not believe or accept or stand for such a doctrine. If you have that attitude, you are going to miss out a lot in your life. The message we are considering today is the message that divides the people that are all that are going through with the Lord with the people that are just temporary Christians in this life. I'm going to approach the subject and I'm going to talk to just the people that are willing to go the extra mile in their Christian lives because I discovered that the people that make history when we talk of history quite a lot of people live in this world millions of people live in this world whatever subject whatever discipline whatever profession the people that make a mark in any profession are the people that burn the midnight oil and they are willing to go the extra mile take a scientist take a researcher and take a medical doctor take the people that want to discover the undiscovered territories in our world they are the people that have the normal profession, the normal knowledge, the normal life, and they have gone through the basics. And after they have got the basics, they determine in their lives that they will go the extra mile. Those are the people that explore both land and sea and space. And when you come to the Christian fold, it's the same thing you find. We have many, many Christians. Perhaps, maybe all that will happen to them is that they'll be barely carried on. So to say, in the Christian life, they'll be living at the edge of Christianity. And by the grace of God, the patience of God, the righteousness of God, and by the uh, prayer of the high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, it's possible to get to heaven. But the people that make a mark, the people that make history and change history, making history is one thing, changing history is another thing. The people that affect the destinies of other people 
and those who will go to the regions beyond and do what the ordinary Christian cannot do. The people that are going to enjoy uncommon privileges in the kingdom. They are these people we are talking about. They are not only saved and satisfied that they are saved. They are the people that say, I want to discover the depth and the height and the length and the breadth of the grace of God. I put it this way, they are willing to go the extra mile. This is what makes the difference between a man in the Old Testament called Enos and the other one called Enoch. Enos, when he was born, the people began to call on the name of the Lord. If you take Cain and you take Enos, you know there is a difference. He went beyond Cain. But when you take Enoch, you go beyond Enos because Enoch walked with God to the point that God decided this one is not fit to continue living in this dirty world. He translated him without seeing death. That man did not even have the promise of a rapture. He did not have the promise that he will not see death. And you know that the sentence of death had just been passed on humanity in chapter 3 of Genesis. And even though the sentence was fresh, that God said, Dost thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. This man lived such an exemplary life. He went the extra mile that the sentence that passed on the whole of humanity, he escaped it. I'm talking to people this morning who want to single out themselves. Who want to say, I don't want to be the ordinary. I don't want to walk the way everywhere everybody is walking. I do not want to be among the rank and file of the ordinary meal of the run, day-to-day -day Christian, so to say. I want to go that extra mile that distinguishes me, that marks me out as a single person different from all the Christians around me. We had many prophets in the Old Testament, and Jonah was a prophet. But... That's a kind of prophet, the ordinary one. The one you have to push and pull and drag and send to the depths of the sea and put inside the whale before he will eventually say, Oh God, here am I. I will obey you. That's a kind of prophet. But there are some other prophets. I said, He singled out himself. Although a prophet, but this one is the one that God said, this one should talk about the virgin. This one should talk about the eternal kingdom. This one should talk about Babylon and all the kingdoms of the world. This one should talk about the fall of Lucifer. This one should talk about the millennium. This one should be a special prophet. And he gave him a special message. And you'll find that I say went that extra mile that's what we're talking about it is possible to say i'm a christian oh there are many christians i'm born again there are many people who are born again but we're talking about the people that single out themselves and they say i as for me whatever others do whatever limitation other people put on their christian experiences I am going the extra mile. Was it only Daniel that was a Jew in the land of Babylon when they, carried, when they were carried away captive? No, not at all. There were many, many of them that had been carried into captivity. But we have from the very first chapter, Daniel, he purposed in his heart here we are in the foreign land and he did not confer with flesh and blood he did not discuss with anyone in this foreign land where we are and we know this despot this tyrant this nebuchadnezzar 
this one that is the emperor of all the empire and his watch is final he feels his even god and if we know that if we take any decision that runs contrary to what this despot likes us to do we know what the consequence will be in the midst of that that man said the ordinary fearful people don't make history the ordinary people that just live the hidden life the the life that is so ordinary that you don't know anything is happening they don't change history and daniel proposed in his heart i'll be one person that is going to take a decision nobody has ever taken and experience what nobody has ever experienced and i'm going to make a mark in history if you're a student of the bible you will know what he said what he did what his life was you will know he even spent a night in the lion's den that man made history and what he wrote down was still expecting some part of it had been fulfilled and part of what daniel wrote down not only that he interpreted dreams for nebuchadnezzar not only that he saved or rescued those sorcerers from death when they should have been killed some of the prophecies he wrote down they, they covered the span of kingdoms and empires and eras that were even still looking forward now to the last week of daniel's 70, 70 weeks of prophecy the people that make history the people that change history the people that enjoy uncommon privileges in the Lord. These are the people that are willing to go the extra mile. What are we going to say? John was a disciple. And Judas was a disciple. John was among the twelve. And Judas was among the twelve. But all those disciples knew that whenever you wanted to ask a question, from Jesus Christ that he didn't want to freely give out to them that he's talking to them by measure he's trying to watch them and then he gives this and he gives this then he keeps quiet and they know there is something remaining that is supposed to be a revelation then they will nudge John the disciple whom Jesus loved they won't call on Judas saying Judas ask for us what is he still keeping away from us ask the new judas was at the edge one leg inside one leg outside a friend of people within the kingdom a friend an acquaintance of the people among the pharisees they knew that although he was an officer carrying the bag nobody really depended upon this one no consecration no commitment no experience except that we're all following on but they knew that this one that went the extra mile and got to the very bosom of jesus you know when all those disciples came together and jesus sat down all the disciples as they were coming to sit down somehow i don't know how it happened they let the seat beside Jesus Christ for John. They won't sit there. Even Peter. Peter that will be boisterous, that will, you know, want to grab the thing. Even Peter. Peter left that seat. Even James. James left that seat. And then when John comes, he will sit down, not with hands folded, not with legs straightened out or crossed, he will lean on the bosom of Jesus. The people I want to talk to this morning are the people that are wanting to find out what is that extra mile, the extra thing, the extraordinary thing that this kind of John did that made him to lean upon the bosom of Jesus Christ. And whenever they wanted to ask any question that required deep revelation, they will say, John, that is your field, ask him. And you know, in fact, when God, Jesus was talking to Peter, and he said, when you are young, you went wherever you wanted. But when you become old, then your hand will be taken. And John was still there. And um, Peter said, if that is going to happen to me, how about your friend? How about the one that you love very much? 
how about this one leaning upon you and jesus he won't even talk about john directly to peter he said what's that to you follow me that one is special if i will that he remains until i come look at that he said you peter you will suffer and you you will suffer you you will suffer how about the one leaning on your bosom leave him alone it's in the special class if i will that he tarries until i come what is that to you and everybody they began to say although jesus didn't say he will not die but they began to say ah, john is gone beyond he will not die every all the christian people anytime they see john they see they say that is him the one that has gone the extra mile he is in the very heart of jesus and you know all the other apostles died they put john inside boiling oil a large drum and they heated it until you know the boiling point of different liquids they vary and the boiling point of oil is higher than that of uh, water they put him inside boiling oil like this he was still there still rejoicing the glory of god was still there they looked inside they thought it, it would have been uh, fried to death and uh, they said john are you there he said by the grace of god i'm still here so they said what are we going to do well let us take him to the isle of patmos where there is an island isolated island where there is nobody there no food nothing whatever as he dropped on the outline he said i was in the spirit on the lord's day and i heard the voice behind me like the voice of like the sound of many waters and when i looked like this guess who i saw i saw the glorified one and he began to describe him and he fell at his feet as dead and jesus raised him up and he said i started with you by revelation i'm going to give you the last revelation i'm talking about the people that are willing to go the extra mile the people that are saying others may stay at the point of salvation others may stay at the point of i'm a christian i am born again i am going to heaven i want to go the extra mile this morning how about you i said how about you so make up your mind you see moses i read the passage to you concerning moses god came to the children of israel aaron and miriam in particular and said do you think you are all equals aaron your high priest and you control all the other priests miriam i know that you are the senior sister of uh, moses and you let these women out in singing and praising the lord when i got you out of the red sea do you think i rate you equal he said moses my servant is not so when i speak to the rest of you i speak by dreams ambitions when i talk to this moses i talk mouth to mouth extra mile extra mile the people that go that extra mile i pray you'll be one of them yeah. is the difference between abraham and lot lot was blessed he had all these and this and this and this but then for abraham that's why i read it to you in james he was referred to as a friend of god and don't you know lord was living inside sodom and god wanted to do something in sodom he didn't talk to lord he went he said can i do anything think about god almighty the one that created the heavens and the earth he said can i do anything without discussing it over with abraham because he's going to become a mighty nation and then he began to say abraham uh, you know i'm thinking of something uh, i I'm, I'm planning that this sodom and gomorrah they're so wicked they're so evil and i've decided their cry has come up to me i am going to destroy them and abraham said god don't go yet can we talk about it and god said if it were another person we can't talk about it we have decided in heaven but since you want to talk about it that's all right what if you see 50 people there abraham i didn't know that's what you'll say if i see 50 people there that's all right i'll spare them well god don't go yet how about 45 people 
That's all right. How about 40 people in that wicked place? That's all right. So how about 30? That's okay. How about 20? That's okay. God, let me speak this last time. Before you take your final decision, can you think of Almighty God accepting mortal man to become such a partner to decide on the judgment of people that had gone so far they were irredeemable and then Abraham said what if you see only 10 people there and God said if I see 10 people there I will spare the whole lot of them and Abraham said that's all I have in mind and the Bible says it's only when Abraham finished talking that God went his way it's not every Israelite that is like that it's not everybody that says I'm of God I'm of God that is like that how many things does God do without consulting you without talking to you without asking you your plan your opinion without allowing you to influence him how many times do you even hear from God that he will discuss it with you mouth to mouth face to face and say this is what I'm planning look at the condition of Nigeria look at the things that are happening who of the christians in this country can god call and say you know why i'm doing this you know why i'm permitting this i'm asking this morning if you will please give me an abraham here give me an isaiah here and give me a joseph here give me somebody here this morning that will say whatever the cost whatever is going to take i am going to climb this mountain I am going to get this experience. I am going to go this extra mile. You are going to change the history of this continent, Africa. And you are going to make a mark in history. And if you will just yield yourself to God and say, I am going to make a mark. I'm not going to be an ordinary Christian. I'm not going to be just, I'm born again, I'm born again, I'm born again. I'm going to distinguish myself and come to a separate class. God will begin to deal with you in a different way, a class by yourself from this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's what I want to say before really talking about the sanctification. You know, I could talk to you about sanctification from here till evening. If you are not willing to go the extra mile, you will hear it. You will understand it. You might even be able to repeat it. You might pray a kind of prayer. You, you know this kind of prayers will pray and stand up and pray and pray and pray. And somebody says in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And then we stop. And then when you get back to the hostel, you'll be like you were yesterday. But this morning, I want something different. Why? See this world. There was a Martin Luther. When things were bad, God found a Martin Luther. Oh, there were other Christians too. There were other people that said they believed in the Bible. There were others that were concerned about the condition of the world. They were concerned, but they were not willing to go the extra mile. There was a time, the time of John Wesley. Things were bad. There were other Christians too. And we know the names of some of them. But John Wesley singled out himself and said i will be the man and this morning i believe as we are so many here and those of you that are from other countries why in your youth why in your young age can't you single out yourself and say see the condition of this continent africa things can change do you believe things can change spiritually things can change denominations things can change all churches things can change who is going to make the change not the people that are just born again born again born again they are the people that are going the extra mile that is why i'm believing you will go the extra mile in fact if we're not going to go the extra mile this whole congress is a waste it means we just come, we sing, we shout, we pray, and after that, our campuses remain the way they were. The country remains as it was. All these countries in Africa, everything remains as, uh, you know, remain as they are. 
and years. Here we are. I believe things will change. We're talking on sanctification and its fruits. Sanctification and its fruits. And um, already you understand uh, many of the verses I'm going to read. I've just spent, I hope, a short time because we need time to pray. And we're really going to pray. So that God will do something. Uh, something burning in my heart. And uh, sometimes we don't have language to be able to tell 1% of what is burning in your heart. But I hope with the limited use of language that I can employ this morning, I believe God will expand it in your heart. And the Spirit of God will inject you with something that will last till eternity. Point one, meaning and significance of sanctification. The meaning and significance of sanctification. When we talk about sanctification, what does it mean? And what's the significance of that experience, sanctification? In Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. In verse 26, you find the verb sanctify, that he might sanctify. Then you find another verb, joined with it, to explain a patch, a shade of meaning of the word sanctify. It says, and cleanse it. And you see that it's referring to the church. And the church has gone for the first cleansing. Because the church has been forgiven. The church has been redeemed. The church has been saved. Because it's among those who are saved. It says he added to the church such as shall be saved. When you are born again, you are added to the church. But then it says he loved the church. And he gave himself for the church. For the purpose in order that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Which means then, if you connect verse 25 and verse 26, it is telling us, husbands, love your wives even as, even as, exactly as, in the same way as Christ loved the church. When you become born again, you love the Lord. When you become born again, you will love your neighbors. When you become born again, you will even love your enemies. But not to the extent that Christ loved the church and gave himself. Sanctification then is that experience subsequent to salvation. After the salvation experience, that is by the act of the grace of God that makes us to go deeper in love, richer in love, more encompassing in love. And the love becomes not a kind of love that is mixed with other attitudes. It is a purified, unfeigned love. Because this is the love of Christ that is passing to your heart at the point of sanctification. Then it says in verse 27 that he might present it to himself a glorious church. A glorious church. Well, if you look at your Bible, you will find uh, that the church at Corinth was church. Even New Testament church. But you could not refer to it as a glorious church. The church of the Galatians is church. But you cannot refer to the church of the Galatians as the glorious church. And so, this is taking you a step further. You have been saved. You have been forgiven. 
you know of the grace of God, therefore you are part of the church. But then, a church within the church. That is, believers within believers. That these people that the Lord sanctifies, they become glorious church. And what are the characteristics of that glorious church? Not having spot. You know, the other churches are referred to the church at Corinth. Paul the Apostle said, can I press you for this? No, I press you not. There is sport. There is blemish. There are things to be taken away from the lives of those believers. But then here it says, not having sport or wrinkle. That is the sign, the mark of the old man or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. It is that stage of holiness where the spots and the wrinkles and the blemish has been taken away. That now you become part of the glorious church. That is what is referred to as being sanctified. Let's look for an illustration. In Second Chronicles chapter 29. Second Chronicles chapter 29 now you need to understand this as students of the bible there are times that god will use illustrations in the bible we call them sometimes types sometimes symbols sometimes parables in the new testament and the depth of the knowledge of what god wanted to pass across he will teach by those symbolic, practical, objective things that they can relate with. We do that in our educational system. When our children are very young and we want to teach them fractions, we will take perhaps a piece of paper and then we will cut in two. And we'll make sure that we cut into two equal halves. We say this is one out of two parts. We say this other one is also one out of two parts. They understand because we cut that sheet of paper in their presence. Then we say, when we say one out of two parts, with the uh, gesticulations or the gestures of your hand, you are saying one out of two parts. We write one, we write two, then we draw a line between them. One out of two. We say the name we give that is half. Here is one out of two. Here is one out of two. When we bring them together, it becomes the original unit that we cut into two. You go through that practical, objective method because the children are very young and they don't understand. But by the time you do that in the kindergarten, in the uh, first primary classes, eventually they now associate half and half to become one. And later, you do not need to be cutting papers, uh, you know, by the time you get to maybe primary three or four, you just say half plus half, they know now it is one. And we do a lot of other things like that too. Even when we get to secondary school, if you are going to uh, talk about the area of a triangle, and here you have a rectangle, from their primary school session, they already know. Now they are doing triangle and other things in primary two. But uh, in the um, rectangular something, you say, well, if this is A and this is B, length time spread is the area. And then you say, how are we going to find the area of the uh, triangle? You slash that thing diagonally. And then you divide into two. Then you turn it and then you match everything together. We well, see that this is equal to this. Then it means that this is half and this is half. That's why we say the area of the triangle is half A times B. And by the time you divide all those things objectively, then they know that this is how to find the area of a triangle. You can develop that to the area of the trapezium or the parallelogram. Now, you do it for them that way because they are young and they are just beginning that area. That's exactly what you find in the Bible. That in the Old Testament, 
you will find that there are things that are done objectively in a practical way to explain the abstract experience you are going to have given in the new testament so now with that background look at um, second chronicles chapter 29 second chronicles chapter 29 verse 5 and said unto them hear me ye levites sanctify now yourselves sanctify now yourselves what does that mean before you know what that means let's now see what follows and sanctify the house of the lord your god the god of your fathers now here you have sanctification in two areas one sanctify yourself you are a human being you need to sanctify yourself but do i understand what that means to sanctify myself what will happen when i am sanctified all right you understand leave that apart for a moment and let us see what it means to sanctify the house of god if we know what it means to sanctify the house of god we're going to make a transfer from the objective practical tangible touchable thing to the one that is human in experience verse 5 sanctify the house of the lord god of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place now because you are not an israelite you may not understand you see the temple of the children of israel had three compartments there was the outer court then there was the holy place you go inside the tent you have the holy place and now you go inside and you have the holy of holies and these people were told sanctify the house of the lord god of your fathers what does that mean carry out the filthiness out of the holy place when you were born again your outer court had been swept had been cleansed your outward sins like stealing like fornication like lying the outward things that you did wrong in relationship with your neighbor all that had been taken care of but then the second compartment internally your very heart your very soul your very mind internally you still find that there are some thoughts there that you'll go to the lord and be crying oh god i am born again i don't want this kind of thought in me who will ever imagine that me as a believer born again and i will not tell lie i will not steal i will not fight i will not do all the outward things who could imagine that all these things are still inside my heart oh lord i don't want this thing you know what you're doing your outer court had been cleansed because you had been saved because you had been born again now the spirit the inner part the soul the one within that i cannot see your neighbor cannot see but god can say you know about it you now want to carry the filthiness out of that inner part you want to carry the filthiness out this same chapter verse 15 verse 15 tells us and they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the lord to cleanse the house of the lord please remember the lord said sanctify the house of the lord and they came to cleanse the house of the lord remember the objective lesson remember going from the known to the unknown remember going from the concrete to the abstract remember going from the cleansing and the sanctifying of the physical house of god to sanctifying yourself because you are now the house of god they cleansed that house of god every kind of filthiness anything that was dirty they carried everything out and they cleansed everything until 
God could be worshipped properly there. In verse 16, And the priest went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it. The priest, in endeavoring to sanctify that house of the Lord, went into the inner part. Again, remember, we're going from the concrete uh, to the abstract. We're going from the known to the unknown. When we're talking about sanctifying ourselves, that the Lord will sanctify us, we're not talking about the outward things. We're not talking about a so-called born again person still saying, well, I'm still smoking, I'm still drinking, I'm still having adultery, I'm still having all these uh, sins, I want to be sanctified now. No, not at all. If you are saved, if you are born again, outwardly, those things in the outer court, they have been taken care of. But now, to be sanctified means that you are going to the inner part. The inner part of the man. And it is that inner part that needs to be cleansed. And it says, they brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it and carried it out abroad into the brook Kidron so that everything can be washed away. That's what we call being sanctified. Let's have another illustration. In Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Reading from verse 22. And he cometh to Bethsaida. And they bring a blind man unto him. And besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town and he had and when he had speech on his eyes and put hands upon him he asked him if he saw all and he looked up and said I see men as trees walking here we find a man remember were you seeing this as illustration? And should you say in your mind, but that's only a case of healing. I understand. But Hagar and Sarah, that's just a family story. And when you come on to the Romans, it says on justification. It talks about salvation. And it begins to make illustration of Hagar representing the law and Sarah representing the promise of justification. You see, the Bible is not like the ordinary book. You see a story here, and this story now, when you come to interpret, you interpret it to tell us some spiritually significant thing. Come back to this story. Here this man knew the Lord Jesus Christ for the first time. And the Lord Jesus Christ touched him and did something in him. What we know is this, he became different. He was not as blind as he was before. But he had not seen as much as he could see. So when Jesus asked him, I've touched you. I've given you the first touch. How do you see now? He looked up. I said, I see men as trees walking. I don't need anybody to hold my hand now to direct me to walk. I see the moving men. Although they look like trees, I cannot differentiate or distinguish one from the other. But I see them. I, I can now see the whole. I won't be able to fall into a ditch anymore because I'm not no more totally blind. He had got the first touch. You know, when you are born again, you see things now. You know that smoking, this is wrong now. This one is wrong now. That one is wrong now. That one is wrong now. Your life now has changed. But you are still not fully, completely like Jesus Christ. Conformed on the total, onto the total image of Christ. You are different from what you were before. But you are not everything you ought to be. That's why you need that second touch. 
that's why you need to be sanctified look at it now in the next verse verse 25 after that he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him to look up and he was restored and saw every man clearly that second touch if you find in your own life that although you have been saved but then you do not think like christ you do not plan like christ you are not completely conformed to the image of the lord like jesus christ then you know that you really need a second touch in second chronicles chapter 25 second chronicles chapter 25 verses 1 and 2 and amaziah was 25 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 29 years in jerusalem and his mother's name was jehoiada jehoiada of jerusalem verse 2 is very significant and he did that which was right in the sight of the lord but not with a perfect heart you see when you look at the outward actions or oh, you say thank god for so and so we can conveniently refer to him as a brother thank god for so and so we can conveniently refer to her as a sister he does she does what is right in the sight of the lord from our own human judgment human perspective at least we know she doesn't tell lies anymore he doesn't do anything that we can say this is sinful outwardly he does what is right in the sight of the lord then god says yes outwardly right morally right but then internally not with a perfect heart at the point of sanctification you now want to go back to the lord so that you will not just be doing what is outwardly right you really want to do what is right outwardly and inwardly you want to do what is right in the sight of the lord with a perfect heart let's go to point two receiving and maintaining the sanctification experience receiving and maintaining the sanctification experience now when we talk about receiving sanctification there are many people that do not know that the things of god uh, actually demand taking what we need to take not only by faith not just claiming it sometimes i have seen uh, places where they will give perhaps a good message on sanctification and then somebody will come to the pulpit and say now we are going to claim it by faith they are running for time they're looking at their program they are looking at the program that if we continue like this we may not cover a lot of ground we may not cover all the subjects therefore the man comes in and he says now believe the lord we claim it by faith and if we agree as touching anything it is done and therefore he prays and uh, wakes, uh, wakes the people up arouses their emotion and he says praise the lord we have got it how many of you know that you have got sanctified and they raise up clap to the lord and they clap unto the lord and they say that all the people there are now sanctified and the following week that pastor is having problems with the members of that church they are not united they don't have the love they don't have the purity of heart and you see a lot of things and that same pastor that said we claimed each last week by faith he now comes to preach sanctification again saying you people what kind of people are you last week we were at the retreat and we were sanctified all of us and here we are today see the way you are doing my friend there are some things that you don't just claim by faith i've seen some people claiming a lot of things by faith and after they have claimed it by faith i've looked at their lives 
Well, it's another story. But you know, I thank God for the way God has helped me. When I was at school, I spent my time and life reading not just the subject I went to read or study at the university. I really studied and read and took notes and went through the word of God. And I did quite some praying. And I needed to organize my time to be able to get the time to pray because I knew we were uh, two in the room at that time. And I knew the time that my roommate will go to the cafeteria. And I know that when it goes like that, they're going to sit on the table and they're going to be talking for the next one hour. And then I put my evening time to dig into the world. I put it at that time. So that there will be no disturbance in the room at all. Everybody would have gone. And I'm telling you, I remember 17th of November, 1965. That time, I was in my second year. And that day, I became so serious. I said, this sanctification this time about 6 30 in the evening i locked the door i knew my roommate wasn't going to come in and i knew that he was going to really spend time there and i looked at the word of god and looked at the word of god and i said god if you don't do any other thing for me in life if i can't get any other thing all i want is this holiness of heart and sanctification i began to pour out my heart before the lord I described to the Lord what I was, who I was. I'd been saved. I knew I was saved. And I knew the difference between salvation and what I was talking about now. Because I had been born again in 1964. And I knew the change that came. And I knew the restitution and the various things that had been done. But on this 17th of November, 1965, I knelt down there. I'm not telling you to cry, but... As I got there on my knees, nobody beat me. I wasn't in secondary school. Nobody rebuked me. Nobody told me this. Even this consecration we're talking about, my brothers and sisters, the preachers didn't tell me about consecration. But I went on my face before the Lord. Some things I still do today, today, now in deeper life, in my personal life, it was that 17th of November I consecrated it to the Lord. There were things I opened. When I opened my mouth, the consecration we're talking about, sometimes it's the consecration that the preacher has preached about. I opened my mouth like this. I wasn't speaking in tongues because it's not the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It was sanctification. The things I was saying in my normal language, telling God that God whatever is going to take whatever you are going to do and i laid everything on the altar it was in my imagination as if there were concrete things that i was saying i put this one there 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 and i said god sanctify me and i'm telling you i, I don't know how long it was all i saw is that by the time i finished my bed was wet with tears by the time I finished, in my heart here, it was like liquid. It was like I loved everybody. It was like I should just stop education. I'm not telling you to stop education. I didn't stop. It was like I should stop everything. Everybody I saw, I should grab the person and be crying and be pleading, please, please be born again. Let's go to heaven together. I got to class the following day. When I got to the class the following day, I, I still listened to what they were saying. And by the grace of God, I was a good student. I still got everything. But there was a part of me internally, inside, that was praying. And I, and I could still hear what the lecturer was saying. I could still write my notes. And I, I had to be controlling myself not to be weeping. Because I remember this one that is not saved. I remember this one that is not saved. It was like I loved God. In fact, my prayer changed. Talking to God. I'll be talking to God like this. As if I was seeing him. Nobody taught me. And things totally changed. I didn't claim it by faith. But God did something. And since that time. I'm telling you, even if nobody believes sanctification, 
even if theologians and i've met a lot of theologians even if they put the buses upside down the thing that happened to me on that 17th of november which theologian can take it away which argument can take it away which study of greek and hebrew can take it away if you will have that kind of thing this morning your life will never remain the same christ will be so put inside your heart that when you reason it will be christ reasoning when you talk it will be christ talking everywhere you go it will be christ leading you there your life will be totally conformed unto the image of the lord jesus christ matthew chapter 5 matthew chapter 5 reading from verse 6 blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled this is the first thing in your heart if you really want sanctification there is a thirst there is a hunger you really want this sanctification and uh, i'm not telling you that exactly what happened to me will happen to you but i'm just uh, telling you what really happened in my life you know after i got sanctified i'll just be going on the road like this and it may be a party a chorus on holiness a chorus on the mind of christ i've never had a chorus before as i was just i'll just be meditating as i was going and all the things i used to see when i was just saved but not sanctified the things i used to see on the campus that uh, will be disturbing me and i'll be struggling with them and saying god i don't want to think like that god i don't want my heart to be like that after i got sanctified i i still saw those things they didn't make any meaning at all unto me and the things that uh, was uh, number one in my life because if you went to the secondary school i went to when you talk about education we were we were disciplined and we were brainwashed that education was the number one thing and that if you didn't have anything in this life you must have education and those who went to the school at such uh, in the 50s they will know that that's the way we were taught and we really wanted to be educated at all costs and when i got to that university my mind was that with that same mind of uh, you know brainwashing i will make this i will make this i will make this when i became sanctified i'm not telling you to copy me i'm just telling you what happened education became number two heaven became number one and you know i was even surprised because then i doubled my reading of the bible i doubled my reading of christian literature i doubled my practices on music I, every, as if i was preparing to be a pastor and yet by the grace of god if they asked any question in class even when it appeared that while they are doing that thing and they are writing on the board and i'm writing my mind is you know uh, saying oh god remember i'm going to preach the gospel oh god remember this one i'm doing i'm just doing it now at my age please don't forget me if i can only win souls to the lord while they are doing that immediately they ask a particular question and all the other students uh, you know they raise up their hands and they are not able to make it when i raise up my hand it will be exactly the same thing in fact i was lecturing students in my own class whenever the teacher didn't come they will uh, come to me and say so and so what is this and i would explain to them and they even felt that they understood it when i taught them more than when the professor taught them and yet this thing was inside my heart you, do, you, do you know that when we're going to take the final exam uh, I, my, my classmates they knew me and quite uh, some of them now uh, will still meet once in a while on sunday nobody taught me not to read and i'm not laying any rule upon your place but i'm just telling you this is not something that somebody said you must do this you must do this i just found out on sunday i was reading bible we are going to take final exam and as we are going to take final exam we are going to start on monday i just find my heart was in heaven i said i was asking myself how are you going to pass exam when every time is heaven every time is bible every time i just said oh god just direct me we got there on monday morning and he put all the questions there and i wasn't a lazy student i when you talk of time management and everything i did what i ought to do 
And when I saw the question paper, I said, ah, so this is what they call final exam of degree. So I, you know, put everything down before the three hours I'd finish and put my pen down. The mediator will not want to take paper. He thought that I may be uh, too religious. I didn't do what I should have done. He said, look over that thing. I said, I've looked over it. And eventually, he was so excited himself. The second day we went for the second paper, he said he never marked any paper like that before. It was more than 90%. And the next paper, the same thing, the next paper, the same thing, the next paper, the same thing. And uh, that's why they gave me first class. And they were running after me to give me scholarship. They said, this is scholarship. I said, I'm sorry, I don't need it. I want to be a preacher. And he said, what kind of uh, fanatic is this one? Well, it's a fanatism that has raised up this deeper life now. When you give your heart to the Lord, I'm not telling you not to be serious with your education. If anybody was serious with reading, I was serious. If I was studying my mother things, keeping to my timetable, if you came around and you wanted my attention, you couldn't get my attention. Because I was that disciplined. It's like if I'm reading my Bible, you couldn't get my attention. If I was studying my mathematics at that time, you couldn't get my attention. And so it is important when you thirst, when you hunger. The point I'm making is that you will have such an experience that all that you are saying, and hey, will I stay? Will I backslide? I for, although I know backsliding is in the Bible, and I and we teach it. At that time, what do you call backsliding? The things that people see in the world, the things that pull their mind, the things that want to make them to backslide, they were not even a problem to me. And I, and I was as young as you are now. At that time, I believe the Lord can do the same thing. If you will have this desire, and this passion, longing at it, saying, Oh God, you will do this for me. The Lord will do it in Jesus' name. And then there will be consecration. We already talked about that yesterday. You will lay everything upon the altar. And you, maybe some of you, you fear consecration because you do not know what God does. When He tells you to consecrate, He called Abraham. He said, Abraham. And Abraham said, Here am I. He said, take that Isaac. He doesn't need Isaac. He doesn't need human sacrifice. He doesn't need anything from you really. He has all the animals on the field and on the mountains. But he wants to have what, where your heart is, where your mind is. And therefore he says, take that Isaac. He didn't tell, he didn't tell Abraham that he didn't actually need Isaac. He only wanted to test him. And he said, sacrifice him to me on a mountain i will show you and the following morning early in the morning abram took isaac and then he took wood he put it on isaac and they were going and the two servants that were with him abram said you servants stay here we're going to do something that you cannot understand we're going to do something that at your level you will be screaming and crying. You will not know how a father can do this in obedience to Almighty God. And then, while they stayed, he was going with Isaac. As our uh, pastor spoke this morning, the, there was no talking. Uh, it wasn't an atmosphere of talkativeness. But Isaac, being brought up in the way of the Lord, knows about sacrifice, that there should be an animal. And then Isaac said, Father, Father, are we not forgetting something? Here is wood, here is fire. Where is the animal for the sacrifice? And Abraham said, young man, God will provide himself a lamb for the offering. And in his mind, he knew his boy was the lamb. And so they went and they arranged the food. He said, Isaac, come near here. And he stretched him. Old Testament. Exodus had not been written. Leviticus had not been written. Genesis. Genesis time. Even that Genesis had not been written. A man just... That's why he was a friend of God. That's why God said, I can't do anything without telling this man. And so, he, he said, I see, come over here. And what kind of child? What kind of child? We talk about the commitment of Abraham. Think about the commitment of Isaac. Isaac, do you know it has come to your turn. Almighty God who gave you to me said I should send you back. Daddy, is that what God said? Yes. Here am I. 
Uh, our sister yesterday was talking about consecrating money, consecrating time. Uh, and we were talking about consecrating a child. This is different from consecrating Samuel and just putting Samuel in Shiloh. This is sacrificing the child. And then he laid the child on the altar. The New Testament gives us the interpretation that he believed in his heart that if he gave this child to God, that God had almighty power to raise up the child, to resurrect that child. This is faith with consecration. While he laid the child down, he drew out the knife. And the almighty God said, Abraham, Abraham, now I know that you fear me and you love me ah, human being nobody has ever done that and nobody has ever done that even after that time i know now that she loved me we're talking about giving up jewelry giving up lipstick and people are saying hey can i do that can i give up uh, we're talking about giving i seek and then god said raise up i seek i don't need your i seek look at the ram there and the ram was waiting for the sacrifice. Look at the prophecy of Abraham. The Lord will provide himself a ram for the sacrifice. And he just went. All that God is looking for is your willingness. He does he need your money? Does he need all these little, little things that we say, Hey, I give this to God. I give this to God. I give this to God. I am afraid. If I give too much to God, what will I do in my life? God doesn't need it. All he's asking is to know what's in your heart. Who is number one in your life? And when you say, Oh God, I lay everything upon the altar. You see? I'm sorry to give my own example again. But it will help you. That's how Paul did. He gave himself as an example. You see, when I was at the university, and uh, our head of department, he was, uh, now he's dead. Very, very serious. And um, I, I told this story before, to those who had come before, he wanted us to do something, and I said, I'm sorry, I couldn't do it. And the other students were coming to me, and they were saying, ah, you will not take certificates away from this place. I went to God. I said, God, I came here. And our school is sponsoring me. And I know that if I don't take certificate away from here, the man in our school is going to write article about me publicly. And the whole nation is going to read it. He was that kind of man. I knew the consequence. But I said, God, you sanctified me. And I gave myself to you. My life is so small and so little. I don't know what you will achieve. Whatever this little life can do, I lay it on the altar. Certificate or no certificate, thy will be done. And I left it like that. It was that same man that was still head of department when I passed out and he still gave me first class. When I was at the University of Lagos there for my postgraduate, we had the same difficulty. And I told the story before. And I took my stand. And as I took my stand, it was in the midst of difficulty that I was uh, just praying. I went to the yard. Those who know Unilag will know behind the El Kaneme Hall or something. I just went to the back there and I was praying and praying and praying. And I said, God, I want to serve you. The postgraduate I came for, I wasn't even thinking too much of it. I said, Lord, I want to serve you. I want to do this. I, want. I lay my life down. And the Lord said, if you lay your life down, go and tell Provost tomorrow morning that you want to come to this place to lecture. I said, God, that's what, not what I was praying for. I was praying for preaching the gospel. God, God said, do what I told you to do. The following morning, I went to the Provost service. And before I got there, the head of mathematics department went in there and said, uh, provost, we need a lecturer here in mathematics. Uh, we are short start and all that. He came out. Immediately he came out. I went in. And uh, the provost said, oh, Mr. Kumuye, what did you come for? I said, uh, we had not taken our exam for the postgraduate. We had not finished the course. We were just in the middle of the course. I said, um, I want to come and lecture here next uh, year, next session. Oh, he said, that's wonderful. Uh, you mean it? I said, yes. He said, don't worry. We'll settle with your, uh, the body sponsoring you and everything. 
with they didn't interview me they didn't do anything that's how they settled housing salary allowance everything and i became a lecturer there just by laying everything on the altar when i became a lecturer then i carried on we we're having bible study and all things provost called me and said ah here they are complaining ah, i said this is my life that if i can't have this bible study there's nothing else to live for he laughed and then went his way i think it was the following month they called me and gave me scholarship and said i should go to chelsea college in london and do a particular kind of uh, postgraduate work again i didn't ask for anything they were pay me here pay me over there you see when you consecrate your life to the lord and you say lord here am i life or death or whatever i lay everything on the altar i'm telling you what god will bring upon your life you will not be able to calculate again in fact it came to a time i said god this is too much now i didn't ask for all this i said don't let these material things even destroy me help me to still keep the spiritual thing as i was saying god is enough is enough he's even giving more that's that's the result when in your life you give yourself completely unto god well let's talk about very briefly you know the message already am i going to pray to you on sanctification are you not teaching it on your campuses to your fellow students number three fruits of your of sanctification number one there will be inner conformity to christ inner conformity to christ number two there will be purity of life your life your heart will be so pure in fact you know sometimes you'll pinch yourself like this and say is it me the thoughts i used to have the things that used to pass in my mind i can't feel them anymore i can't find them anymore because the heart is so pure and the heart is so holy number three uninterrupted holiness the holiness now is not the intermittent holiness holiness in the day and then in the night you are struggling it is uninterrupted holiness and then number four circumcise heart he will circumcise your heart and the heart of thy seed to love the lord your god with all your heart all your soul all your mind number five pure unselfish perfect love pure unselfish perfect love number six unity with the brethren unity with the brethren you'll find yourself in a meeting like this if there is any conflict if there's any argument it throws against your spirit i i remember after i got sanctified if i was in a meeting you know with uh, my colleagues at that time who said they were christians who also professed to be sanctified and they were talking and this one talked and the other one was struggling to also push out his opinion immediately in my heart there'll be this liquid and the, and then my eyes without even crying aloud the tears will be flowing i'll be saying how can people of god be arguing with one another like this how is it that we cannot sit down and let the other person have the platform and let him talk and uh, while all that was going on then they might uh, see the way i was and they might see that already i was a uh, feeling because to me it was like they were dividing the body of christ and they were cutting christ in pieces and they were knocking christ and uh, and bruising christ again that's the way it looked to me when they were arguing and in my heart i would not be able to talk i'll just be praying oh god give us real sanctification that will give us unity and eventually most of the time they refer back to me and say uh, brother what do you think about this and by the grace of god the little um, incoherent word i might be able to speak they might say that is all that is what we're going to do you see when you are sanctified you don't want to argue you don't want to criticize you don't want to be divis divisive you don't want to pull anything apart when you are sanctified you want to remain in unity with the people of god and when you are sanctified number seven there will be higher consecration higher consecration by the grace of god every time i still hear about consecration like after i finished preaching yesterday when you were praying i was praying to you 
I said, God, what is it? What is left for me to consecrate? I was looking for, because I literally given everything. I literally consecrated everything upon the altar. And after the messages there, I said, Lord, there should still be something. A death had not reached. A height had not reached. There should still be something to consecrate. You see, after you have been sanctified, there is that desire in you. You are looking at Christ on the cross. You are looking at the way he shed his blood. And you are saying, if Christ did this for me, what else can I do? And you will want to do something more. Every day it will be, oh Lord, something more. Something more. And I believe that as we pray today, the Lord will sanctify us. That what we have been talking about in theory, I believe that it is today. The Lord is going to do it for us. Before we pray, Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12. It says, So to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. You know, there are times our hearts are thick, our hearts are dense, our hearts have no feelings at all. Our hearts do not tremble at the word of God. It appears so hardened. And then we we'll say, you heard this morning. How can you hear a message like this and you're still like that? How can you be hearing all these and you are dull and dense? You, my heart today, if you don't change, I will change you. You break up your fallow ground. You open your mouth. You talk to, the, to God and you say, oh Lord, put the word in my mouth. What if I don't know how to consecrate, if I don't know how to pray, if I don't know how to manifest faith, if I don't know how to grab this thing, if I don't know how to do like Jacob, except you bless me, I will not let you go. If I do not know how to do like Isaiah and grab the house of the altar, oh Lord, do something for me because it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and raise righteousness upon you. We need to seek the Lord. God is wanting to see the people that will go the extra mile. The one that will go the extra mile. The one that will go the extra mile. The one that is willing to say, Oh Lord, here I am. Oh Lord, here I am. I must be sanctified. Do you really desire it? Are you willing that whatever it is in your heart, in your nature, in your attitude, hidden within you, that the Almighty God with a surgical knife will cut it away? Let the Lord do it. Let him transform your life. Let him change your heart. Let him sanctify you. He can do it. A deep experience subsequent to salvation for the people that are willing to go the extra mile. For the people that are willing to say, God, do something new. Do something fresh in my heart and life. Is there anything you are holding back from the Lord? Anything you are holding back from the Lord?
late on the altar. Be willing to go any length of the Lord. He wants to use your life. He wants you to be special. Don't be like the run of me, Christian, the ordinary Christian. The role of the male Christian will not achieve much in this world. Be a Christian that can make history. A Christian that can change history. A Christian that will enjoy uncommon privileges in the kingdom. A Christian that will affect the destinies of many people. Seek the Lord. the Lord like Jacob with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind seek him like Jesus in Gethsemane thy will be done not my will thy will be done I submit, I surrender I yield to the will of the almighty God and let him sanctify you let him sanctify you much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The labor of all church workers shall never be in vain as our father, the father of all globally, the convener of GCK, Pastor Dr. W. F. Kamui gives us the Global Church Workers Conference live from Taraba State, Nigeria. All church workers and ministers globally to join hands with all ministers across Taraba State, Northern Nigeria from 17 to 20 November 2022. It's our time for triumphing in ministry, even in troublous times. Pastor Dr. W. F. Kui will be ministering 8 a.m. daily from Jalingo, Taraba State, to the world, via satellites and all our social media platforms. It will be an avalanche of global expositions and revelations. Your labor will not be in vain. When we started the year 2022, you had hopes, you had desires, you had dreams, but suddenly, all over the globe, we read and hear of failures economically, politically, with climate change and security breaches here and there. And now, I hear a voice echoing towards the northeastern geopolitical zone of Nigeria. Now, I hear a voice echoing towards the northeastern geopolitical zone of Nigeria. Today, the Lord is saying, 
weep not. All your tears are dried. Because, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed. And it's confirmed. That there's still one hope, one way, one solution, and one power that never fails. The power of Jesus Christ reverberates this November with GCK Live from Adamawa State, Nigeria. The land of beauty set to beautify your life through Christ. As the covenant of GCK, Pastor Dr. W.F. Kumuyi will touch down in Adamawa, Nigeria with a power that never fails. Healing. Deliverance, salvation. November 24 to 29, 2022. 1600 hours GMT daily and 0700 hours GMT for Sunday worship service. Young people from all levels will be empowered for excellence at the Impact Academy on November 26, 2022 at 0600 hours GMT. Ministers and professionals will be empowered for breakthrough in ministry on November 25, 26, 28 and 29 at 0600 hours GMT. Our guest gospel minister is Bob Feets. This is an avalanche of manifestation of the power that never fails. For all lie, power will herald your celebration. Dr. William Kumui says, Be it confirmed in your life in Jesus' name. GCK, the gospel to every creature.